So, so here we are. Here we are, Susan Maicelas. Thank you very much for joining me into this Always. new way of conversation. Always, Monica. <laughs> Wherever, whenever, however. This conversation that is behind the scenes has been going for, for a long time because we've known each other for a long time, but this is really the first time that we kind of work together, work together closely and I'm able to interpret your work into the space. Yeah, well, I love that you're bringing it into a new space, a new kind of space, literally a space and a set of relationships that, of course, I don't know and I may never see, unfortunately, but... <laughs> But yeah, I, I trust mean, you, Monica. I trust you. Yes, and I really value this trust that you actually gave me to kind of actually see the, see the, um, uh, um, to see your work into the space. Susan, uh, your work was always kind of, um, is part of an in conversation with another two artists. When I actually was thinking of, of Kurdistan, you know, um, I thought of a new space in Lanskrona, and the space is very much of an outdoor space in the center of the city. Um, and, and there are another two artists, and this is part of, uh, I call them clusters, but they are like almost uh, a dialogues, and I title it Undefined Boundaries. And I was kind of exploring this idea of, the, of reflecting on this notion of permanent borders and the, and the permanent human-made sort of borders in the geographical landscape. Mm. And, and I felt kind of Kurdistan for obvious reasons, you know, for their history, their history of being the largest ethnic group, you know, without a legal state. And the legal state is what to give you voice and representation in kind of the, the global uh, world. And by being a stateless, you know, it, they, uh, as a nation, they are the result of the, con the, the suffered consequences of different sort of uh, conflicts and shiftings in political, uh, uh, local sort of uh, relationships with the global world. Now, I have always sort of, I'm so drawn to your work because the idea is that you stay. Mm -hmm. You stay and you stay long, but you stay and, and in terms you give us this kind of a broader historical uh, look into a situation, into a topic, into a conflict. But also there is an aspect that you stay, but you refresh it, you transform it. Your work is always um, reinterpret, and you bring it to life. You know why this? Always mm -hmm. thinking, you know, Susan Mesellas stays in work for such a long time, and it gives us this really long understanding of an issue and of this problem. Mm -hmm. It's sort of been an evolving practice. I don't know if you begin with that notion because I think you can't sustain all the relationships with every image that you make going forward. But this project, you know, I'm first reflecting on how this project begins because I read about, you know, the Kurds fleeing the borders of northern Iraq into Turkey in 1991 in the second Gulf War. And so it begins with exactly what you're referencing and the reverse path that I took was to follow where the Kurds had left from northern Iraq into that place. What, what was the place that they had left, not the place they went to, which were refugee camps and onward. So now, in a way, the longer cycle of life, I couldn't have anticipated 30 years later, still following those paths of escape and dispersion and the diaspora community around, you know, which is really a global community. Mm -hmm. I didn't anticipate all of that as I crossed the border from Iran into Northern Iraq in 1991. So when I say the ideas, I, for me, ideas and relationships evolve in the field. The concept comes in the field to then ask, well, who are they? You know, coming, going back to where they began, where I, 
first read about the Kurds, of course, the deeper history that you just referenced, the colonial history, the sets of relationships, the, board, the literal creation of the borders, all of that I have to learn. You know, I have to read and I have to listen. And the listening becomes more important than in fact the reading. The reading is a rigid interpretation. The, the listening opens up this sense that I'm in a timeline of image makers, of many people have come and gone from Kurdistan. And so I hear about that from the Kurds, the people I begin to meet. And that's what creates this sort of, you know, kind of, kind of maniac mission actually, <laughs> to see if I could trace the roots of all of those who made images of Kurdistan over a century of photography. And so the, the project Kurdistan in the Shadow of History is trying to unpack those relationships, visualize, create a visualized history. Um, and that's not, first of all, that's not just the first reportage as a photographer that I make. It moves me into a more curatorial researcher, investigator mode. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in Sweden where there's, there was a large community of scholars working all over Sweden. In fact, I spent three weeks in Sweden. I think it was probably in 93 or 94. And I remember thinking I hadn't met one Swede. I just went house to house from one Kurdish part yeah. of the country to another. And they came from Turkey and Iraq and Iran, etc. So, you know, the relationship, um, evolves because if you're listening people lead you different places and if you're willing to just respond by moving with them um you make extraordinary discoveries and that's so how that's how i broadly reflect on that period the second stage of revisiting has multiple expressions because there's making a book which has one kind of fixed form, though it brings this community that's dispersed together in one object, which even though they might not have a state of their own, they have a state of being that they identify with and identify themselves to be different than the neighbors they are in the midst of other kinds of political states, you might say, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, principally Syria. You know, the, this notion of identity that you carry from within, that you are distinct from your neighbors to maintain the traditions that are just not only those that you see when people dress in a particular way or speak a particular language or celebrate Nehru's together mm -hmm. despite the boundaries that have separated them legally. So that also was fascinating to me to understand. And you know, I had, um, I felt myself working collaboratively with a, a whole network of different parts of the community to gather this history. Uh, um, the book was one expression, then it was an exhibition that, in which the, the work we found literally went on the road and, and was for eight years traveling throughout mm -hmm. Europe where the diaspora lived in France, in Holland, um, Germany, Greece, many, as well as the U.S., you know, different parts of where the Kurdish community had settled in numbers. And, and that was a tremendously important period up until about 2003. We actually republished the book in 2007 because 10 years later, there was both the death of Saddam, which had unleashed this war and this kind of brief insurrectional period under Saddam. And, um, and there was a Kurdish president, which was un inconceivable when we first did the book in 97. So it had a reason to be re-engaged. And then that led progressively to this notion of a story map, which has been traveling with my retrospective only, where you really feel the the fact that people are just in constant motion and transformation through migration patterns, resettling and still reconnecting back. 
but forced, continuous forced migration, mm -hmm. sometimes economic, sometimes political, obviously families growing up, generations, etc. So I, I feel there's a natural organic process to continue to revisit what it means to be Kurdish for them as they express themselves in new ways in new communities. Yes, but also what is super interesting is about your work and about your practice and, and how I understand your practice uh, to be is that you have your, um, like you have explained, your historical uh, identity, as it were, the community evolving timeline. But as a practitioner, as a creative practitioner, you revisit the world always differently. You never mm -hmm. been frightened to embrace technology, the latest sort of uh, technological tools. You are not frightened to, to rather than stay in a, in a safe place, in a safe formula to always break the ground and you're still doing that. Mm -hmm. And for me, what I realized, because of course this exhibition, this work was awarded last year, the Deutsche Bourse, after the Jude Pom exhibition in Paris. And so it has life. The, the work in itself is not the idea that you're bringing something that you have done to oh, almost two decades ago. It's like mm -hmm. now you reinterpret it. So for the visual practitioner, as it were, you know, it has always new life and a new kind of experimentation. And, and for me, this, this combination of staying with, with a topic for a long time, because we can see reference to that in Nicaragua as well. So mm -hmm. the idea that you stay in a topic, but you are not scared to come in from an experimental new practice to mm -hmm relieve and you know the, the work and i think this is this kind of the aspects of your work is what really well, interests me you know monica the question is what is the work mm. you know if you think of the work as a set of images that you make and they're they're made and they're done and it's only framing them on a wall or in a book or etc yeah that's one kind of work. But if you think of your work as a practice which is collaborative in, in the best of ways with a community that is also transforming, you know, sometimes that's built around single images. I, I mean, I would say single relationships, you know. I mean, the, <coughs> the, with the Prince Street Girls, which is a very early project, those girls who I photographed when yeah. they were eight and 10 are now, 50 plus and I might have a relationship with them, but I don't express it visually, but I maintain a relationship that makes it a special ongoing part of my life, you know? So I think that if you become fixed only, you're making pictures and pictures then have mm -hmm. places to be versus pictures are part of a process of a set of relationships in the world, it, it's a different orientation maybe. Um, you know, I, you know, the, the, uh, when the work went back to Kurdistan, there was always, there were, there were a number of chapters because of course, because of the very difficult periods of civil war, it was hard even to initially bring the book back. And even though the book had come from many parts of the community in Kurdistan itself, across the different borders, I couldn't bring it back. I had one, you know, it's an interesting story because there was one opportunity through a gathering uh, called Women Mobilizing Memory in Istanbul, which was a show in a contemporary gallery. Um, you know, sadly, the, the man who organized that and who owned that building, Osman Kavala is in jail. He's been in jail for three years, but we were able to show work that was controversial at the time, even any representation of the Kurdish culture was, was at risk, would put him ultimately at risk, put everyone, challenged everyone who participated. Um, but it was there that the, uh, you know, I'm just thinking that I had done this, I had the AKA Kurdistan, mm. which was a website after making the book, where I imagined that there would be more stories that I hadn't come across and people could upload those stories and visualize those stories in a number of different ways. So that was 
when you refer to a digital landscape, yep. it's just the beginning of the, you know, in 1998, the web being a, in cyberspace, a safe place of exchange. And then when I represented that, so we had a map and there were dots on the map and there was a timeline. So AK Kurdistan was the first time that, you know, there would be this viral, you know, kind of crowdfunded, yeah. though I, not crowdfunded, but crowdsourced imagery. Yeah. And, um, the interesting thing about AK Kurdistan is that then when I made a physical representation of that for an exhibition in, in, in the Hotel de Ville in Paris, which was probably, uh, I don't know, something like 2003, that exhibition was going to migrate to Istanbul in 2014. So, you know, 10 or so years later. And it seemed innocent enough, you know, all it is is on a wall in a modern gallery. And the organizers of the exhibit could not print out the map because the map showed this representation of the homeland of the Kurds in 1945 that had been presented to the UN. Mm. So I was faced with a problem. What do I do with all the little stories that had come through the web exchange? How would I do it? And that was when I made the breakthrough of there are no borders. So you're right, talking about borders mm -hmm. to bring these bodies of work together, mine and others. But in fact, what I was seeing is the, the, the border is in your mind and in your, you know, in our minds, looking at others, those are real borders and are points of exclusion or potential inclusion. And so this migration of people and carrying their stories into new environments became the representation of just a painted map, which you saw at the Jeu de Pomme. Mm. And the other wonderful part of the Jeu de Pomme show was that a week before we installed that, what I call now the story map, we opened up to whomever would like to tell a new story in France. And so there were 15 other new stories from Paris generated the weekend before and placed on the map so that Again, it, it's not a fixed representation. It's a set of questions that lead to different strategies of inclusion and visualization, you know? Mm. You can't tell all the stories. But when you see someone reading someone else's story at that story map, it's still a very moving moment for me. Yeah. How much time do we give to another? And I realize that in the representation you're doing in, in you know, in a public space, it's the ultimate test for an image to, to engage someone without the full context of either the making of the work or the subject's history, which are decontextualized in whatever representation. So your challenge as a curator is to bring these deeper ideas forward to engage people with the mystery of what lies behind, you know, the making of the work or the linkages that you're hopefully creating successfully. You know, that's the challenge for the public yeah. and for you as a curator and the community that, you know, is willing to engage with the work. Susan may sell us, we can talk for days. I wish we could, I, I wish, wish I was could. there. I wish I was there. My sadness is not experiencing the full rendering of your mind yeah. at work in this city because I am just imagining. I'm just imagining. It's incredible. We will have sort of the streaming and the online, but I have been here to be able to see the audience. They have a very mixed community here. The audience yeah. engaging with the work, uh, stopping, reading, reading carefully the text. Uh, it's super rewarding. I have already seen it and we haven't even finished and open. We open it on Friday, but I already seen it, um, different layers of the audience. So, so how will people, just so people like me get to know what mm. people there are thinking, what kind of form are you creating for people to respond to the work? So, the so they have a, a very strong, uh, presence in the community, the festival. They really start with the idea of schools, the school come over, 
different sort of parts of the community and different audiences. They actively organize activities and these activities, they will be kind of uh, the educational department of the museum, which is just behind your piece, you know, sort of organize and coordinate this from the educational perspective. Mm. So this is the kind of the work month long uh, project that the festival kind of does with the city of Lanskrona and the region. One thing that for me was uh, uh, very rewarding is that I knew because of the current situations we were had to almost sacrifice our uh, international audience experts as it were the presence in the city like uh, the online program is going to be very varied and it will be projected we're going to be streaming everything but that kind of uh, physicality of the experts in town we understood it was going to be challenged to secure in April. But the city of Lanskrona made the decision to continue the exhibitions because they felt that they did not want to sacrifice their community and the regional audience to actually not be able to engage with culture, with the dialogue. Mm. And, and this for me was very inspiring. And mm. they have seen an increase of Swedish people coming to the city because, mm. of course, they, a lot of people cannot travel, so they are not traveling to other countries. So they're staying, and as a result of that, the local audience is higher. And, and we will have a, a response, we will have a response from the schools, the educational programs, the, the tours, and everything that it would be conducted from Friday onwards, how the actual people is responding to the works. Well, please find a way to make some part of it visible for me because yes. Kurdish, there's a large Kurdish community throughout Sweden. Yes. Not that that would be the reason they would come, but I certainly would love them to feel part of yes. you know, the expression of the festival. So we yeah. will record, we will share. Thank you very much, Susan Meselas. Always a pleasure. <laughs>